So we're thrilled to welcome one of our own from UTA here to the stage. His work focuses on climate change and he gains insight into our current predicament, timely, by investigating the past. He has studied human adaptation to climate change around the world and most recently has focused on the American Southwest. Please welcome Dr. Scott Ingram. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Well, if you're like me, you've probably heard this a number of different times in a number of different ways. But if you're like me, you may be kind of tired of, getting, of hearing this all the time. I don't know exactly what this means. I don't know what it means to know history. History is long, it is complicated, and there's so much of it. What is it that I'm supposed to know? And I certainly don't believe that I'm doomed to repeat it. I don't believe that I am or society is doomed to repeat anything. And if we're supposed to take something like lessons from the past, how do we reconcile all the differences? The differences in population levels and connectedness and differences in technology that we would need to reconcile if we're gonna take lessons from it? Well, despite these problems, there does seem to be some truth to this. We know as individuals that we do learn from experiences. So this is the subject of my talk today, how we can learn from the past. And specifically, how we can learn from the past to help us today in the present. And this is my answer to that question, is that I think that we should ask questions of the past that matter today to find insights, not lessons. And that is my idea worth spreading. So this just isn't a play on words between insights and lessons, because I think that they're fundamentally different. An insight is a general or intuitive understanding of something. It might, in fact, beg more questions than answers. Whereas a lesson is something that's true in any time or any place, something that we might learn in a mathematics class. And I think if what we're asking of the past is that it provide for us insights, we then don't have to reconcile all these differences between the past and the present, because we can just take the insights, not the lessons. So the past that I'm talking about today is, in fact, the prehistoric past the past that existed thousands of years before history. So let's leave history to the historians, and let's go to prehistory, where the thousands of years represent the many different experiences we had as individuals and as groups, the social choices that we had to make. And in the ground, through excavation and careful analysis, we can see the results of those experiences. And let's, let's look to that. And when I say ask questions of the past, I don't mean the who, the what, the when, the where, and why of the past that we're often focused on. I mean, let's ask questions that we're concerned about today. Questions about sustainability, questions about collapse, about human vulnerability, and human resilience to natural hazards. These are the questions I think we should be asking. And today I want to focus on just two of these, collapse and vulnerability. So today, let's come back to the prehistoric past with me. Let's go on an archeological thought excavation, back to the prehistoric North American Southwest. Imagine yourself at 30,000 feet in the air, looking down on that place, which today occupies the modern states of New Mexico, Arizona, Southern Colorado, and Southern Utah. So our view is kind of obscured, but we can see the settlements there, and those are represented by these red dots, settlements that range in size from several family units to as many as several thousand people. Now, we don't know where everyone lived, but we have good maps like this because of 100 years of archaeological research and thousands of people that have helped contribute to the survey and excavation and the understanding of this past. And I think my colleagues at Archaeology Southwest and GeoMap and the Museum of Northern Arizona, because they've compiled that information and allowed us to be able to display it on maps like this so we can see these snapshots. So in addition to the red dots, you see that there are blue squiggly lines. Of course, those are the rivers. The blue shaded colors on the map represent the higher elevations, and the brown shaded colors represent the lower elevations. Now, this is not a single people ruled by a king or a queen. This represents many different peoples, many different languages, many different ways of doing and being. So just as if we cannot know exactly what happened every uh, place and, and every time in the past, we have to be content with 50-year snapshots. So this represents where everyone lived during this 50-year period. All right, so let's go back to the past and let's ask this question 
that we care about today. A particular question, does drought cause demographic collapse? Many people are worried about that today. I am, perhaps you are. As our climate warms, I'm particularly worried about it in arid areas. So let's go back to our maps and let's roll the clock of time in 50 year increments and see what happens. So here's 1200 to 1249, 1250, 1300, 1350, 1400, and 1450. So where the dots have vanished, what that means is that people have moved from one place to another. And in some cases, some settlements might have actually gotten bigger. Some people may have moved somewhere else when the dots vanished. But most of all, what we're seeing here is a decline in the number of people. The birth rates are less than the death rates. This is the demographic collapse of the prehistoric Southwest that occurred between 1200 and 1400, about 800 years ago. So let's take another look at this. And let's keep our eyes focused on the top of this map where we see all the red dots. 1200, 1250, 1300. You see they're all gone. This is a rapid depopulation in what you may recognize as the Mesa Verde region. 1350, 1400, and 1450. Okay, so let's bring in some outside information on this question of does drought cause demographic collapse? And this is a climate history. The blue jagged lines represent the amount of rain that fell every year in the past, and we can know that because of the careful work of tree ring scientists. And we can identify in that precipitation sequence the droughts, and that's represented with the red bar. So during this period in which the northern southwest was depopulated, we see that in fact, yes, there was a drought. So if we want to take a lesson from this, Let's take the lesson that drought causes collapse. But that would be a mistake. That is too simple, and that's not what I'm talking about. First of all, this confuses this kind of a conclusion where you have just one thing that happens in the past and another thing that happens in the past at the same time. That confuses correlation and causation. But let's not dwell on that. Let's take a more complete look at the past, the kind of look that generates insights and not lessons. So this is a look at the climate history that begins in 1100. Now, I don't have maps that start in 1200, but if I did, it would look very much like the map that you saw in 1200. And you can see all the red bars representing all the droughts. And below it, you can see the blue bars representing the wet periods. So this is a highly variable climate, just like it is in many arid regions. And let's overlay our period of depopulation, that period when the settlements and the dots vanished in the northern part of the map. And we can see, in fact, that the drought that occurred there is quite a small one. Seems unremarkable in the larger climate history. So let's just ask a few more questions on this issue that we're concerned about. And that is that if drought causes demographic collapse, why didn't it occur here during the mid-1100s? Look how long this drought is. This is 50 years long. So if drought always causes collapse, then we should see that collapse occurring here, but we don't. And if drought causes collapse, why didn't the people return? during these wet periods, identified the blue bars. And we're all in a drought here in Texas right now. Does it make sense that all of us would need to leave if this drought continues and got worse, or only some of us? Well, because the answers to this question are not very satisfying, it makes us realize, and the careful scientists that have worked in the northern southwest realize, there were many factors that contributed to the collapse, and drought was only one of them. So let's see what we might take here for an insight from the past. So an insight from the past would be that drought as a single cause of regional scale demographic collapse is in fact unlikely. And we can know this simply by looking at these maps. And think about what we saw. We saw the dots vanishing in different places in different times and at different rates. And it occurred over a 250 year period. What is the likelihood that a single cause played itself out over approximately 10 generations of people? What strikes me is unlikely. There's another lesson here that we can take, and that is that a long-term term view is essential for understanding. Remember our short climate history, and when we put the human behavior on top of it, it looked like the two things were related? Well, that's not the kind of view. And looking at the past reminds us that just because two things happen at once doesn't mean that one caused the other. OK, let's ask another question that we care about. This is a question that drought planners and policymakers are concerned about all over the world, particularly in arid regions. And this is, where is drought-related migration most likely? 
Where are the places? If you're preparing for a warming and drier climate, you're de designing adaptation mitigation strategies to help those people. It would help to know where the effects of a drying climate would be most severely felt. So let's go back to our maps and take a look. You may have already noticed some patterns. But let's just see, let's let the clock of time roll, if there are any patterns that emerge for us. Well, I don't know about you, but I kind of notice a pattern that has to do with people moving to water over time. And a simple lesson that one might take from this would be that drought-related migration most likely is most likely in areas with the least water resources. And of course, that makes sense. That's a common sense assumption. If drought and water is the problem, those that have more of it, those that live near the rivers and in areas of high precipitation, they're not going to have as much of a problem. We believe that in the present. But this is really interesting. I took a look at this question in one place, just this area where the blue circle is, and I looked very carefully over a 250-year period, and I compared the movements of people in their exact settlement locations and that climate history I showed you. And you know what I found? Is that people that are living in areas with the most water resources are in fact the most likely to move when drought hit. So the people living near the rivers and in high precipitation, you hit them with drought and they quickly move to somewhere else. Whereas the people that live further away from the rivers and in areas of lower precipitation, they tended to stay put, put and not migrate during, during when these droughts happened over that 250 year period. So let's think about what a lesson here might be. And that would be that relative resource abundance, that is those people, for example, that live near those, those wetter areas, might in fact increase vulnerability to declines in resources. So I'd be worried about the phoenixes, for example, that have access to a lot of water, no matter what the actual weather conditions are. So this insight, in fact, is close to a hypothesis. And I said that insights actually make us think of questions. So if there are any drought planners in the audience, people that are working on mitigating the challenges of a growing climate, I would go up to you and say, look, I found this thing in the past. I found this unexpected relationship that people that had the most water were in fact the most vulnerable. I don't know whether it's true today, but let's take a look at that using all of our modern precipitation data and census data on movements and see if we've discovered a relationship. And if so, that'll help us better understand what we need to do in the present. All right, I'm sorry to say we now have to come back from the Southwest and from prehistory and the possibilities for insight. Now, I could have taken you to Egypt or anywhere else. The point here is not the North American Southwest or drought. I simply showed you that case to show you how insights can come from asking questions that we care about today. And the purpose of this is for all of us, for the entire world, so that we have more insights and more knowledge to address these challenges that we're facing with sustainability and collapse and vulnerability and everything else that is on our minds. And this presentation has been about the how, the how we can use the past to inform the present. And my idea we're spreading is, is that we should ask questions of the past that matter to us today, to find insights, not lessons. Well, I started with expressing my dissatisfaction with this quote, those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So let me uh, make that go away and leave you with something that I am more satisfied with that I think makes more sense for our thinking about the past. And this is actually a quote from T.S. Eliot. And it begins, we shall not cease from exploration. And the kind of exploration I've been talking about is the exploration of our common prehistoric past, the past that contains the experiments of countless choices and ways of living, and we can find those through a close examination. Think about what we could learn that we could use to address our current problems if we looked at past peoples in many places around the world, how we might be able to use those insights to address our problems today. So we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Thank you.